All right, everybody, thank you for coming for another session with Crypto with Brando. And before we move on, I just want to say the multiple parts of this video are going to be going over the having and the all-time high breakthrough. Number two will be a summary of past bull markets, specifically from the point of view of the having. And then part three is going to be where we are now and where we're going in the next one to three months with Bitcoin's price. Alrighty then, folks, welcome back to another edition here of Diving Deep into Crypto with Brando. We're going to talk about something pretty fun here today. Uh, this is my favorite topic, to be honest. It is Bitcoin halvings and more importantly, the cycle, the monetary cycle of Bitcoin. That sentence alone can probably write its own book as thick as War and Peace. Uh, I'll save that for later this year. I probably will publish at least one or two books. Just a little out warning there. Keep your ears open. Uh, but we're going to keep this concise to probably around 20 minutes-ish. We're going to go over the having because it is approaching. It is currently April 2nd, around 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. As I'm recording this, the having is approaching rapidly. Um, it is on April 17th is the last I've heard. It, it moves in and out depending on how efficient the blockchain is over time. Uh, it's coming, coming very soon. So I thought it was relevant that we not only go over what happens during the halving, but also what happens before and after on not only historical standard, but I also want to bring you through what has happened in prior crypto markets, because that's where we can derive at least a decent expectation about market behavior moving forward. But of course, we have to add in the new things because there's a lot of new things. So we're going to go over the current state of the market as well, where we are, where we just were, and where we are going in the next three months. Okay. And then last but not least, we're going to go over just a quick um, name change, at least us here at Nova Capital or Let's Go Brando, however you want to put it, are going to start calling coins because I think we need to start changing the name of certain crypto coins and tokens overall to avoid any confusion and to make things a little clearer about what asset class we're talking about because eventually these are going to become their own asset classes. So we need to start that conversation now. I'm not asking the industry to float this terminology. I'm just letting you know this is the terminology we're going to use moving forward. That will be the last quick part of the video. All right, so let's dive in here and just simply talk about um, what's happening right now and kind of the big scoop. And the whole reason I'm doing this video is because we are off script. We're pretty on script, and I've been calling things pretty accurately, uh, at least I think so, over the last year. I started doing this a year ago. It has evolved into a company much larger than what it initially started it out as. But we've been calling things pretty well, uh, I think. We're on script on that way. But the only thing we are very off script with is hitting an all-time high. We hit an all-time high for, for back in February. Traditionally speaking, all-time highs don't happen until after the halving. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you in part two as we go through the uh, historical halvings. Uh, but we did hit it in February. The halving isn't until two weeks from now. So that's new. Don't know what to make of that. Actually, the, the explanation is pretty logical. Uh, the ETFs, obviously, a uh, huge retail demand through the ETFs, through people's IRAs and mutual fund holdings, 401k holdings, regular stock accounts, any which way that the majority of Americans in the Western world hold their um, securities money now has access to the Bitcoin. There's no longer a you know, roundabout with Coinbase. Yes, you can't hold your coins, but to the average person, they can now buy Bitcoin and experience that alpha. So that's obviously what has created the big wave. And of course, as we've gone over before on this channel, the big banks need to buy more physical Bitcoin to back the fund. That is the demand coming in to the market. That's why things shot up over the first month. The demand supply imbalance on the exchanges was drastic. So that's why we hit all-time highs. Uh, is the effect of Bitcoin realized? No, it's not. It is not a stock. They don't trade at multiples and, you know, of, of a 10x premium or anything like that. It's not 
a, an exact science in crypto. It's starting to get there. And this video is going to really try to hack its way through the darkness of trying to get to maybe some determination of at least a qualitative system on how this thing works. I will develop a quantitative one as we move forward. Don't worry about that. Uh, but for now, it'll just be a qualitative one. It's difficult to really understand where the exact value of Bitcoin derives, uh, but it is, the halving has not really hit. Um, I argue that really between last year and this year, I think the, the price of Bitcoin, the price that the market comfortably trades it at is 40 now edging on 50, $60,000. So if that is its real price without the excitement in between, the having is going to literally demand at least a 2x bump in order for miners to stay profitable and to maintain their current margins. So the market is going to need to bid up the price at least 2x. Will hype and true organic growth in the Bitcoin ecosystem internally and demand externally drive things even higher? Frankly, I think so. And I think that we're going to go well past 120 this cycle. However, I don't know the number and I don't know when, and I'm not saying that you count on it. I think a fundamental price that should go off in all smart traders' heads and investors is $120,000 price. That would, in my opinion, begin to slowly take some risk off the table because things will get silly after that. So that's where we are. That's why things are interesting. And that's why I felt it prudent to make this video. However, aside from that, everything else is on track too, uh, that the patterns have stayed relatively consistent throughout its history. I'm going to dive in a little bit about the history of the halvings. Uh, we're going to try to see if maybe we can determine what Bitcoin's going to do by looking in the past. Okay. I don't know why the past is that way. Maybe, maybe it is. Who knows? Um, but let's dig in. Now I found something pretty cool. Uh, usually when you go on to major price sites or exchanges, they do have graph data for you, but a lot of them are cut off at a certain point. Popular cutoff points are like 2020, 2021, although that's probably a really new site. Another popular one was like 2016 and you don't see a lot prior to 2017. And all you see is like a blip on the radar and then you see today's 60,000. Well, the reason Bitcoin graphs are skewed, and I don't have this set up with me today, but in the, in the very near future, we're going to do a proper chart setup where things are going to be set in a logarithmic scale instead of a linear scale. And that's why things look so disproportionate in Bitcoin, because if it was uh, an a logarithmic scale, it would look very proportionally. You would see all the waves and they wouldn't really be hidden on a number chart. It would just be different levels of 10. Okay. Um, but so for right now, I did find, I did find like ancient price data. Um, it's not raw, but it is accumulated in interactive chart force. So we're going to go through that. And it's really cool to see the very, very nascent days of Bitcoin. Bitcoin came out in 2009. Through 2009 and 2010, it didn't really have a price. It was like this thing cyberpunks used. Yes, it was used in the dark web. Yes, it was used for drugs and other things. Of course, you have this thing that no one's heard of except like three people at the NSA. The government can't even track it. No one knows what's going on. Yeah, of course, you're going to use it for illegal things. Um, or you're going to just use it for cool things that you can't buy through dollars, whatever that might be. Uh, so in the. From 2009 to 2010, there like literally was no price. And then sometime in 2010, the people started bidding for Bitcoin via flash drive. So think of your, I don't have one here. Think of uh, your flash drive. Okay. People would store the Bitcoin, which you still can. It's essentially a cold wallet, by the way. If you ever hear the term a cold wallet, that's a cold wallet. It's a USB drive, maybe with some software to interact with Bitcoin, but essentially it is a USB drive. Okay. So um, that's a cold wallet. Um, and people used to take those and bid them on eBay back and forth. And so like you bid $50 for a thousand Bitcoins and someone else is maybe offering $200 for 50 Bitcoins because there was no price. That was the very, very beginning of price discovery in that very illiquid 
market. Okay. But it started getting a price. And so we're talking about 10 cents now. Okay. We're in 2010. And then it starts rising in November of 2010, late 2010. It starts getting picked up and it goes to 30 cents. It goes to 40 cents. It goes all the way to a dollar. And that must have been a really big thing back in the day. Bitcoin is now parity with a dollar. This thing that came out three years ago in 2009 that no one's ever heard of is now a dollar. All right. We'll see you later, cyberpunks. And it turns into its very first bull market. And it crescendos all the way to, believe it or not, $28, around $30. Bitcoin peaks at its very first bull market. Now, as interesting as this is, let's back up and look at where we are in the cycle. It's every four years, right? Bitcoin started in 2009. 2008 was like the first origin genesis block 2009 the network started going we're nearing the end of the four-year cycle 2012 is when bitcoin is going to have so my only hypothesis here is that a combination of just network effects people finally started hearing about this thing with the having coming up probably drummed up a lot of interest and it hit parity or trying to hit parity was probably the goal of a lot of early traders. And then it finally hit that. And then we cooled off into a bear market all the way through the rest of 2011 into early 2012. We kind of bottom out uh, as we're leading up to the having. The having, by the way, the first having was November 2012. I was a freshman in college. November 2012. I never heard about Bitcoin. Didn't hear nothing about it. I was not even in finance yet. So 2011 bottoms out. It starts regaining traction. Now keep in mind, and this is going to be concurrent throughout the themes as we go through this. $3 at the bottom. It was 10, 20, 30 cents at the beginning of the bull run. That's a 10x return from bottom to bottom. And this is the first bull market. These 10x returns have stayed relatively consistent, not 10, but these major returns from bottom to bottom throughout a whole up and down cycle have re have remained throughout every bull cycle. You're going to see. So we're hovering at $3 now at the bottom. We're entering a halving. So the cycle is going to reset. We're going to start halving from 50 Bitcoins a block to 25 Bitcoins a block. In November of 2012, we're leading up to the halving. Prices are slowly recovering from the brutal bear market of 2011. Does this sound familiar? Prices are recovering. They're recovering. We're back to $10. The market trades Bitcoin very comfortably at $10. The halving happens in November of 2012. Then a few months later, let's call it three, four months later, we have an epic bull run that goes from $10, $15 to $200 a coin near vertical peak hits in April. This is really honestly a five month, six month bull market, but it is Bitcoin's first big bull market. Okay. Um, into 2013. And then we bleed out throughout the rest of 2013 um, as the market recovers. And here's where your more common data is accessible here at uh, CoinGecko. And we're going to start all the way where we just picked up, folks. Isn't this kind of cool? Here we are, July 2013. And the bear mark, here's the big bull run that lasted five months. And the market continues in a very jigsawed way to decelerate. And this is around the time of Mt. Gox's kind of the coin base of this era. The bankruptcy and everything that happens in Mt. Gox starts. We're going to have a whole video session on that in the history of crypto because it's fascinating. And the bear market continues to be very, very brutal. You do see a slight recovery. We're going to also have a whole another video on bear markets. Okay. That's a whole, especially this last time, this last one. We're going to have a whole another section on the bear markets. We'll be we bottom out. Long very long. And it's kind of surprising me even looking at these numbers like this right now. So the bull market ended in late 2013. Let's call it very early 2014. 
is when the Bitcoin bull cycle faded away off of the 2012 halving, and you have a bear market that lasts all the way to 2015. So a full year bear market, full year bull market, or year and a half bull market from November 2012. Now, we bottomed out. The cycle's going to reset in 2016. In July of 2016, the cycle's going to reset. So here we are in 2015. We bottom out. The market is licking its wound. It's back to 200. So here we are at the bottom in 2015. But this bottom price was the peak price in the 2011 bull run. So four years later, you're back to all-time highs back then. And this is the bottom. Okay, folks? This is the bottom. And $15 was where we were coming from before that bull market. And the bottom here is in the 200s. You understand? You starting to get it? Okay? It's not about this straight line go up. It's about how your wealth moves over time. It's the compounding effect that I wish someone went back in time and told me. Because, fuck. So, let's keep going. We're going through 2015. Market starts to heat back up. Give it six months of really probably, it must have been terribly boring to be a trader or an investor throughout this stretch. Really, nothing happened. 15 starts heating up. 16's coming around the corner. We're going to slide this all the way to basically where we just were, but we're going to phase it over into the 2017 bull market. The market continues to heat up throughout 2016. July, the halving occurs, but really it is more or less a non-event. In fact, prices go down a little bit. There really isn't much movement for quite a few months. Why? Because there's a supply lag. The miners have to realize this impact. They're harvesting more Bitcoin. It takes a while for that supply shock to hit the market. It's just like COVID. It's a supply shock. The prices are going to go up. But when you're holding Bitcoin, this is when in inflation is good and the value of it goes up. Okay, This is the where capitalism comes in, folks. This is where you want to be the market and you want to be the business owner, not retail. The halving occurs, momentum begins in the market, six, seven. Okay, we're going nice. And then the beginning of 2017, all hell kind of begins to break loose as we go straight through the year. And once again, peak at the end of 2017. No coincidence there. I don't mean to point out any calendar coincidences, but we do peak out all the way to the end of 17. This I remember very vividly. I was starting to get into crypto around this time. Uh, it, it was pretty nonsensical and pretty amazing. And then we cool off into the 18 bear market. I remember that very vividly. That was my first business. Again, we're going to have a whole nother series on the bear markets. But you guys see, you understand what's going on here? And then let's slide this over. Okay. Now we're looking into the COVID market that we just went through a few years ago. And as we recover from 3,000, by the way, guys, the bottom of the 2017 bull market, 3,000, $3,000. Bottom of the last one was 200. Okay. Getting it. We're recovering at 3,000. Oh man, $3,000 is so bad. Yeah. Go back three years. No, it's not. The halving of 2020 is earlier in the year. It is in April. It is in May. Okay. So we're getting drummed up for the halving. The, we are recovering. This is 2019. Excuse me. 2019 was a great year. We do recover nicely back into the uh, five digits for Bitcoin. We cool off through 2019. Kind of similar to what we had in 2023. We had a lot of like nice up, down, up cool off, heat up, cool off. And we had that kind of pattern throughout 2019, although it was a little bit more bearish. And then as we go through 2020, the halving is coming, but the market is kind of just taking it along and digesting it. In fact, the market sells off pretty sharply here, back down the five and six. And we continue to chill until we really start heating up in September, I would argue. So again, you're looking at a five, six month price lag. Okay, it's not immediate. The halving effect is not immediate. But what happens by September, October, we have the run, good run that was cut short. That'll be a whole nother video. And we double top here, which I did not expect to double top. I thought it was it. 
I thought that we were cooked by March. But not only Bitcoin, but Ethereum and the other altcoins did top all-time highs higher than they did in March. So res respectively speaking, the altcoins did better and they continued, and NFTs in particular, continued to do very well throughout 2021. Bitcoin got uniquely hit, but it was really everything else that did very well. But again, we're talking about the halving, so let's stay focused. The market begins to wind down throughout 2022. It was a very bloody time. The Fed was raising rates. The, the labor market was doing great, but capital markets were getting sucked dry. And then by the end of 22, we bottom out with FTX. 2023 comes, we recover. Does this look familiar? This looks just like 2019's graph did. And now we're really beginning to accelerate here very early. We've never, so now I think you understand. We've never seen an acceleration this early. The halving is not even here yet. The market should be like this still. We should be in the 40s comfortably. Why not? But 70? Why? I don't know. ETF, mass adoption, institutions coming in, global governments getting in. Yeah, probably all the above. And maybe the system is just breaking faster. If you ask anyone, myself included, are things better? They're not. I'd argue they're getting worse and they're getting worse faster. So maybe that's the reason. All right. Now that we have an understanding of how things not only freaking compound throughout every Bitcoin cycle, but how the market reacts around the halving, uh, I thought that was a pretty unique experiment. I never really looked at it from the halving like that in that particular way. Saw some price movements that were pretty incredible uh, when you look at just through the history uh, of it, I think. Uh, but that's me. That's why I'm a nerd. But what I got the screen on here, this is a screenshot of... Uh, daily candles or uh, weekly, weekly candles from um, early this year till right now. This is taken from CoinGecko and each candle is a week and it's just showing where Bitcoin has been moving since early 2024. Um, the purpose of this segment is to just go over where we are right now and where we expect things to be and where you can expect things to be. So, like I said earlier, we usually don't have an all-time high hit. Normally, prices range somewhere comfortably in this area, in the 40s and the 50s. And I thought we were going to continue doing something like that now, from January to now. Obviously, ETFs do play a part in that. Uh, so an elevation to 60 or 55, not surprising, but the rally all the way to over 70 uh, did take me back quite a bit, but it's not a bad thing. It's really not a bad thing, right? Um, it just shows that the market's way more bullish for crypto than really, I think, anyone figured prior to this. Uh, so where I see us going in the next month, walking into the having, walking out of it by early May, which, you know, you could still argue April, the whole month of April is the having month. So it's a unique kind of month in the space. I think we're going to see something like this. I think we're going to see further down to 60 and we might even touch, well, it'll turn green in between. You can mark your bottom dollar that. I'll try to do a little rebound. That'll be week two. And then week three, as the having comes, sell the news event, we'll probably reset down the here. This is kind of the magic 55K is where the weekly moving average is right now. Slightly under. We need to... Reconcile with the weekly moving average before prices rebound. If Bitcoin goes under the weekly moving average, the bull market's usually faltering or it's over. And it lasts for the whole year. Okay. And that, we'll dive into technicals in another video. I'll get into that. But take my word for it that we want to stay above that or, or retouch that weekly for more momentum. And we want to stay above it. So this would be the target area week three toward the end of April. And then I could see us recovering. And again, hanging out in the recovery zone, not really knowing what to do with ourselves. I think the market will be slightly depressed that we've had a, a down. So we could see a little bit of a, of a recovery. We can have a little hanging out and things can get more active. I do expect this May, June, the market to pick up. And frankly, it'll look a little bit more 
like this by the time we enter May, okay? And things will start to move. I think by the summer, we're going to see, let's see what we can do here. Oh, cool. By the summer, I think things are going to begin to get vertical. And we are going to, come on now, it's not letting me draw more. But I think by the summer, we're going to have quite the escalation turning to parabolic well through 2025. As you saw, these bull markets rip right through. They don't care about calendar years. So we're going to have higher prices well into 2025. And we're going to be in 2025 expecting higher prices. We're going to look back in April and be like, oh my God, I should have remortgaged my house. Seriously, that's how high it's going to get. Um, I think we can be in the 100K by Q1, Q2 of 25. I don't think 24. I'd be surprised if it was 24. Maybe hot the holidays, but I don't see 100K until the holidays or early 25. But I think we're going to hit 100. And then when we do, it's going to crescendo into silliness. And we'll do 120 is that sweet target, right? But 150, maybe, maybe even touching two at the end. And that would be at the very end of 2025 as the greater monetary cycle will wind down. But also keep in mind, folks, the election, I'm not getting political. It's just the truth. The election's coming and you know who probably going to take it. Sorry if that hurt to hear, but it's probably the truth. So if he is going to take it, the economy is going to boom just like it did last time, because he's going to lower tax rates. Not things that are healthy for the country financially, just saying what is. He's going to lower tax rates. He's going to drop interest rates. He's going to pull all kind of levers and bells and whistles to actually get the economy moving, because in my opinion, we've been in a uh, stagflation recession ever since 2022. So he's going to do everything he can to get the economy moving, and he will, because it happened last time, which is why people are going to vote for him again. Anyway, keep that in mind, okay? 2017 was actually the year he was sworn in. So that could also have something to do with the momentum of that era as well. A lot of positive factors, a lot of tailwinds coming in, conflict in the Middle East, having institutions, everything is a green light. It's looking really good. But for the next two, three months... I really don't see us moving. I think we're going to chill. And it's good because it gives people like you and me time to get in. It gives my future clients time to get in. It gets you time to get in. Uh, but the window is small. So do it as quickly as you can. I think by early summer, things are going to be moving along as they were just a few months ago. And we're just going to be inching up. Nothing crazy, but we are going to be inching up a few percent a day on average as the market ticks us higher through the summer. So uh, get ready for that. It could be a faster and fiercer bull market too, but that's where we are. That's where we're going in the next few months, early summer, things really start to kick. You have a little bit of time. All right. Well, you made it. You made it. Thanks for watching this long. I'm surprised you lasted. I barely lasted. Um, we're going to quickly go over, this is for subscribers only. Thank you for following and follow us on Instagram as well. You'll get much shorter, much more digestible content there on a daily basis. But what happens if I'm slightly off? All right. I've been on the money more or less minus the all time high. What if I'm off on this too? I think the next one to three months are going to be a good window to get in. Well, the only two ways that I'm off, because I'm expecting a lame market, so that leaves the only other two scenarios in one to three months from now. And that is that the bullish momentum isn't stopping. This was a brief little sell healthy blip, and we are just going vertical. Uh, and by the end of April, we are at 72, 73 maybe even approaching 75,000. And by the summertime, we're trading at 100. Okay, that is possible. Wow, I have to wait till the next bull market if that happens, <laughs> but it is possible. So keep in mind, a really unexpectedly bullish momentum is possible. That's why you always want to be invested now rather than later, but you can always increase your holdings, but you can't go back in time 
and do it then, right? You can always increase your holdings. You can take some money off the table real quick, but you can't go back in time, especially with the compounding power of Bitcoin, as we've been talking about today. $300 all-time high, $300 bottom, $3,000 bottom the next cycle, $18,000 bottom at FTX, all right? You cannot afford... You cannot afford to lose your place in crypto. By now, there's always time to adjust, but things can really go vertical that way. The opposite can also happen, and this would be more dependent on a macro scale. Uh, I'm in the camp that inflation's not really going to go down, and we're going to just continue having 3%, 3.5%, and things aren't, you know, the economy's going to, or at least hang on, but inflation's not going to go down. And that could revise Federal Reserve estimates to only two cuts or maybe push them out way to the end of the year, which would still adjust risk models on Wall Street. And that would change all the algos for risk on sentiment, which would pull money out of risk on. We're already seeing higher interest rates in the bond market today, a serious uh, support level that's been holding throughout 2024 so far has broken through in U.S. Treasuries. Uh, Interest rates are pumping higher. So this scenario that I'm talking about is possible. I'm not really betting on it, but it is possible that interest rates go back up. We go back into the four and a half to five, even maybe five and a quarter range that we were in mid-23, just because Wall Street's getting scared that if inflation doesn't really go away, the Fed will be determined to keep rates where they are, or God forbid, even maybe raise them higher in order to slow things down. So that's a possibility. Keep that in mind. Uh, But I do think the most likely outcome is that we do less rather than more. Um, a, A interest rates would take risk out of the system and crypto being the number one risk out of between stocks and bonds it's going to take a hit. Um, so, you know, we, we would go down on 55 and maybe more. So that would be a serious correction, something akin to the twenty back half of 2019. But we would have the halving. So that would really throw the script all over the place. So just, just be aware of those potential quirks. All right. And then for the name classification, we're going to dig into this more and more as we go through. I just felt that it'd be easier to change the way we talk about crypto names. We always say Bitcoin and then we say alts and alts stand for alternatives, meaning coins. And that phrase really got picked up in the 2016 cycle when Litecoin and Ethereum were charging forward and trying to catch up with Bitcoin's market cap and dominance. And in doing so, the three coins that everyone talked about, at least in the first half of 2017, was Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum. And then Dash and Monero was coming in, Zcash was coming in. And at this time, people were like, well, these basket of coins are the alternatives to Bitcoin, and here's Bitcoin. So like back then, it made sense. But now there's tens of thousands of cryptos out there. There's some with utility. There's some that are meme coins. And there are some that are in between. So I think, and we're going to, again, develop a quantitative level for this. This is just qualitative. All today was really just qualitative analysis. But nonetheless, that is still very important of identifying trends. I don't think you can do quantitative without qualitative. Uh, I think we're going to call the coins that are the big boys. The top, it could be the top 10, most likely will be the top 10, maybe top 20, but top 10 top coins that have been around for over two cycles and that have continuously grown in price and popularity and technological improvements. And without a question of a doubt, three that come to mind is Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Arguably, Solana could be part of that. Uh, There's a few other coins that you could argue should be part of the majors. Um, I don't think Monero and Dash deserve to be there. Neither do do Zcash because they've they've nearly claimed their former glory or their past runs never really multiple X'd and their values haven't maintained over time. 
like the ones we just discussed. So those would be called what I would say is miners. They've proven themselves to multiple cycles. They're not necessarily going down, but they're not really leading the market in innovation, in price, and popularity, yada, yada. Um, also part of the miners can be M-I-E-R-S, M-I-N-O-R-S, miners, minor league. Anyway, you know what I mean. The miners here in the minor league could also be up and coming coins. And maybe we'll have to make a distinction about that. I don't know. Maybe we have to come up with another name, a third name for the up and comers versus those that have languished and underperformed. Uh, and, and frankly, in, in my opinion, Ripple is kind of in the middle of being a major and a minor because it's not really taking forward in price and at least technological innovation like we all thought it would, but it is moving things forward. The company is doing well. They beat the SEC and price isn't necessarily down. So arguable, but nonetheless, Solana is an up and comer. AVAX is an up and comer. Uh, AVAX came out last cycle. So it's been plus one cycle, but not fully two. And it hasn't shown us that it can make new all time highs and on top of all new all time highs, you know, their bottom will be respectively multiples higher than the last bottom. So we need to see that kind of two times. I'm big about two times. I'm big about you can do something once, you can do it again. Um, you know, if one time is nothing, you need to really show consistency in prices or markets, it doesn't matter. So it's, you know, two times plus. So Solana, AVAX, all these guys I talk about, all these guys I really like. Miners, up and coming, but miners. And then last but not least, the major category, and I think they might be the the of this cycle, is the meme coins. And that name kind of speaks for itself. Doge is a meme coin, but arguably a major meme coin, right? Because it's been around for so long and it's done so well. And it, it itself has launched all of the meme coins and dog coin, you know, bonanza. Um, Shiba would be a miner. It's gone through one cycle. It's shown resilience. Let's see what it can do. Dog with hat. That's just a meme coin. That's just, I don't know what that is. I'm in it. <laughs> I'm in it, but I don't, uh, I'm crossing my fingers, but I, what I meant by this is the last point, And then that's it. I'm signing off. Every bull market has its froth and it's plainly speaking bullshit that goes up exponentially and then nose dives so freaking hard in the 2016 cycle it was the icos it was the initial coin offerings there's all these companies who were going to change the world with some blockchain tokens and then in the 2020 it was the nfts right hey take a picture of my frame bro and now this is three hundred thousand dollars like come on um, so the NFTs were the froth and the bullshit, not that NFTs don't have a place and that NFTs don't have value, but to the level that they were in 2021 coming with GameStop as well. No, uh, I think this cycles bullshit is going to be the meme coins and someone is going to put meme coins and AI together and they're going to claim to heal everything, including cancer. And they'll try to be the kind of. You know, the doge of this cycle, the real big winner. I think that's what's going to happen. You're going to either have a meme coin or AI coin or both really try to take over. And well, after Bitcoin's all time high has been hit in mid 2025, late 2025, these little, you know, what's are going to keep popping and keep going up when like, like, you know, that's the last remaining capital is just going to be flying into whatever else hasn't gone up. Um, but, all right. Hope this was informative. This was a long one.